My name is Soro Cataldi, and yes, that's how it's spelled. Uh, I'm the quantitative analyst at Pinnacle Advisory Group, and part of my job has to do with managing the several quantitative models that we use here to support our investment process. And so today, I thought I'd share with you the latest and greatest from two of our models that look at the S&P 500. And we'll start with the Pinnacle Valuation Model, whose goal is to value the S&P 500 um, the S&P 500, so in other words, determining whether the equity market as a whole is cheap, expensive, or fairly valued. And we know that uh, research shows that valuation is not a particularly good short-term timing indicator, but it's very effective at forecasting returns in the long term. The Pinnacle valuation model is based on a broad uh, variety of different valuation metrics because we follow a weight of the evidence approach where we don't want to rely on any one particular indicator, but look at the broad evidence, excuse me. And then finally, the model has been in use at Pinnacle for many years, but over time it has evolved as we always strive to incorporate the latest research into the model, and we added uh, also additional factors to the model. So let's take a look at the, um, the factors that are currently in the model. We divide them in four categories, where in the first category, we have price-to-earnings ratios. You can see here we have six different, different factors, and the difference between them is in the definition of the earnings. So for instance, at the top, you see the forward PE. That forward PE uses the definition of earnings, that is, the estimated earnings over the next 12 months. On the other hand, the five other factors that you see in there use a historical definition of earnings. And actually, some of them normalize the earnings to remove some of the cyclicality that is due to the economic and the business cycle. The second category is called yield-based measures. And here, we look at the valuation of the S&P 500 in relation to the valuation of other asset classes, for instance, government bonds and high-yield bonds. The next category we call non-earnings measures. And here, the idea is similar to a price-to-earnings ratio except that instead of the earnings, we use an alternative measure of uh, company performance, uh, such as sales and cash flow, that is not as easy for the managers to manipulate through accounting. So it's a, it's a more, um, it's, a, it's a truer uh, measure of performance. And finally, the last category we call intrinsic value measures, but it's more of a residual category. <coughs> and you can see that we actually added a factor in there uh, in the last year, it's the ratio of corporate profit to GDP, and that is a commonly used uh, proxy for profit margin. So let's take a look at a line chart of the valuation model over time, starting with what it looked like a year ago when we last met. The red line on this chart is the valuation model, which is scored from uh, on, a, on a scale from 0 to 10 that you see on the left side of the screen, where higher score represents uh, represents a more attractive, a cheaper valuation, and a lower score represents a more expensive valuation. And you can see that the line goes back to 1981. Now, uh, the blue line, on the other hand, represents the S&P 500 annualized return over the following 10 years. So you can see that the, the blue line actually stopped in 2004. That is not by accident. The value of the blue line in 2004 tells us the return of the S&P 500 over the following 10 years. Now, uh, two main things changed with this chart since a year ago. The first thing that changed is that we were able to collect additional data for the factors in the model uh, going back another 30 years. And so we were able to almost double the size of the sample that the model was based on. And we already knew that the model was effective at forecasting uh, long-term returns since 90, 1981 to date, but we were able to test the effectiveness of the model even over the prior 30 years, and we found out that the model was um, very effective even back then. That is shown by the R squared of 74 percent. R squared is a statistical measure that tells us how much of the variation in, in returns of the S&P 500 was explained by the model. So 74 percent is a pretty high percentage. And the next thing that changed since last year is that the model, uh, the, the S&P 500, excuse me, gained approximately 30% in a year, and in doing so, it became more expensive. And the model, if you look at the, at the red line, is showing us that by going from four, roughly 4.5 out of 10 
uh, a year ago down to 3.01 as of the end of February. So as we draw a green line across the, across the chart, you can see that uh, the model uh, 3.01 out of 10 is not quite as low and as expensive as the market was at the, at the market peaks in 2000 and 2008, but it's more expensive than any other time before that. And so clearly the model here is telling us that the S&P 500 is becoming expensive. Now, in the next um, table, um, the uh, score of the valuation model is divided in five ranges, going from the uh, lowest range that represents overvalued um, indicators uh, up until the highest range from eight to 10 that represents undervalued readings of the, of the model. And what the table also shows us is from for each range, what was the average 10-year annualized return of the S&P 500 following that kind of valuation. And a better visual for those returns is given by the bar chart at the bottom, where you can actually see a very nice progression from the low returns that we saw following overvalued markets up until the very positive returns that we have from undervalued markets. So currently, uh, I said the, the model is reading three out of 10, which puts us in the mildly overvalued range. And historically, from that range, the <coughs> average 10-year annualized return over the following 10 years was roughly 5.6%. That is still a positive return, but it's well below the average that in investors normally expect uh, from an equity. So now looking at the other model that we have that looks at the S&P 500, this is called the Pinnacle Quant model. And uh, on the other hand, the objective here is to forecast the S&P 500 over the next six months. So a much shorter time frame than the valuation model. Again, um, we have the usual weight of the evidence approach. So it's, uh, the model is based on a variety of indicators from different categories. You can see we have technical and sentiment indicators that make up the majority of the model, but we also have selected uh, indicators from economic, monetary, consumer, and credit um, you know, categories. So basically, it's a very broad range of indicators that represent probably the, the same indicators that my colleagues look at every day on a regular basis, except that the model does so in a much more efficient and objective way. <laughs> Finally, the model is dynamic, and what that means is that there's actually a built-in feature in the model that allows it to adjust to the latest market conditions to, e to be even more effective. So taking a look at a line chart of the model, the red line again represents the model, which is scaled uh, again from 0 to 10, where higher is better, higher is more bullish, and lower scores are more bearish. And the uh, blue line, again, represents the S&P 500 return, but this time is over the following six months. And um, if we divide the range of the model in the usual five brackets, you can see that lately the model, the red line, has been in the second highest bracket, which we call mildly bullish. And actually, very recently, it has moved higher, and it almost touched the eight line, which is the, the line that separates the mildly bullish bracket from the bullish bracket. Now this chart goes back uh, only five years, but actually the model's inception is uh, 1990, and since then the R squared has been 45%. I already explained what the R squared is, tells us how good the predictive power of the model is, so 45% is a pretty significant result. Now we can look again at a table that um, shows us the, the, the five different ranges of the model, and for each of the ranges, uh, it gives us the average return over the following six months. And again, we can look at a bar chart to have a better visual. And here you see deeply negative returns over the six months following bearish readings of the model. And then a nice, almost linear progress progression to positive returns following bullish readings of the model. And um, so I said the model is reading uh, 7.99, almost 8. Currently, that puts us in the mildly bullish range, and historically, that has been followed by an average six-month return of 7.6%. However, if the model should, should cross the A-line and move into the bullish range, the average six-month return will go up to 11.1% over the next six months. That will be the expectation. 
So clearly that would be an above average return for a six month uh, time frame. So we looked at two models. One telling us that the market is overvalued and we should expect below average returns in the long term. And the other one telling us that market conditions are bullish at the moment, so we should expect above average return in the short term. So how do we reconcile the two messages from the model? The first thing we can do is look at the predictive power of each model over different time squares. And I explained what the, the R squared is, so we're going to look at the R squared as a measure of predictive power. And the table here shows uh, different time frames going from as short as six months all the way up to 10 years. And it gives us the R squared of each of the two models over each of the time frames. So looking at the valuation model first, we can see that over a six month time frame, the R squared is only 5.9%, which is pretty low. However, you can see that the R squared of the valuation model goes up as the uh, time frame gets longer, and it, it's, it becomes as high as 64.4% over a 10 year time frame, which is a you know, pretty significant result. Then you see that the opposite is true for the Plunk model, where you have the highest R squared over the short time frames of six months and a year, and then the R squared goes down as the time frame becomes longer. So this is telling us clearly, for the long term, you should rely on the valuation model, and for the short term, you should rely on the Plunk model. So we can have a better visual of that through a line chart, where um, the blue lines represent the uh, valuation model. And you have, on the horizontal line, you have time going all the way up to 10 years. And then on the vertical line, we have return. So as the valuation model is telling us that the market was undervalued right now, let's say we could expect an above average return of, uh, for instance, 15%. On the other hand, if the market was fairly valued, then we would expect an average long-term return of 10%. However, we know the valuation model is telling us right now that the market is overvalued and we should expect about 5% over the next 10 years. But we know that you know, equity markets don't move in a straight line. Usually there is significant volatility and we can expect to have the same volatility over the next 10 years. And that is what the Plant model is designed to capture. So you can think that uh, the Plant model has the curvy red line that goes up and down and the fact that the model at the moment is bullish uh, probably means that, you know, it's telling us that we're probably in front of one of those upswings that you see on the chart marked by the green line, by the green arrows. So in conclusion, the two models are kind of disagreeing right now. The valuation model is very effective in the long term, telling us to expect below average returns. And the plot model is more effective in the short term, and it's telling us to expect above average returns in the short term. So I think the conclusion here, we can say that right now, according to the model, it's probably not a good time to be a buy and hold investor. Because if you just bought the S&P 500 today and held it over the next 10 years, the valuation model is telling you, you would likely be locking in a return of just about 5%, which is below average. However, if you're a tactical investor such as Pinnacle, you may be better positioned because you because you'll have the flexibility to take advantage of the upswings in the market and at the same time defend against the downside risk that we know to be significant when 